Hello and welcome back to the lab. Welcome back to EE for everyone. If you've been following along the channel, then this video may not surprise you. But in our previous video, we were using this LCR meter to figure out a few little details about how this uh, DC filter inductor, notice it's rated at DC only, how this thing responds when we apply AC. And now that's not really a surprise because when we look closely at the construction, it's, it becomes quickly obvious that this is made with a laminated core, which is notorious for being very lossy at high frequencies. That's why modern core materials were made. Now, when you're dealing with DC or low frequencies, that's not a big deal. But as frequency increases, we can start to see that the efficiency of this inductor is going to start to fall apart. Where, of course, by fall apart, I just mean it gets really bad. Let's remind ourselves of kind of where we're starting, what we are competing against. And in this case, uh, let's set it up at 10 kilohertz because that's where we plan to use this with the uh, the dev kit. No, well, 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 whatever. Yeah, we'll call it what it is. The uh, inverter module dev kit where we hooked up some FETs to the inverter module slash gate driver. And yes, it's going to be awesome. That said, we need to make sure that we have an inductor that allows us to properly evaluate it. And given that the quality factor, the Q factor of this inductor is 2.48 at this frequency, I think we might have a little bit of trouble. For reference, if we put this down at our minimum frequency at 100 hertz, the quality factor is 19. That is a lot better. Let's see if we can do something better than that. Of course, we can't do that without parts. And for those that have been watching the channel a while, you will probably be, I don't know, maybe excited. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll be bold. I'll say excited to see that we've gotten out some of the old equipment that we got. We've got a transformer bobbin. We've got some ferrite cores. We've got the capped on tape. That's right, folks. We are winding a custom inductor today, and I hope to demonstrate some little details about custom inductors. Let's walk through just some very basic fundamental principles of inductors. Right on, right on. It's time for the fun part. Where, of course, by fun, I mean I'm pretty sure I added an extra winding here. <laughs> we'll see if this meter is accurate enough to really figure that out. So I guess, where do we start? Well, I've run a couple quick analyses. Been playing around a little bit with the Epcos. Epcos? Epcot? Whatever. Epcot. What I've got here is an air core inductor. Right? It just so happens to be on this fancy bobbin for soldering into a circuit board. But we've basically just got an air core transformer. And man, this is difficult to keep right side up and on the screen at the same time. So I'll do the best I can. So clip one right there. Clip two 
right there. There we go. That's straight-ish. And what are we getting? Huh. Only 27 microhenries. Quality factors, not great either. About the same as what we had. Bump it up to 10 kilohertz. Yeah, not great with this here inductor that we've just wound. It's really not great at all. Well, let's see what happens. I've got some ungapped cores. I've got some gapped cores with two different gap sizes. And what that will allow us to make is an inductor with a gapped core of different sizes. And if my calculations are correct, I believe we might need to get another gap size on order. But there's two things that I want to do with this. I just want to, in theory, this should go really, really quick. Because all we're measuring is basically stuff that you can see in the data sheet. But this is not super revolutionary. This is basically leaning on a parameter called AL. It's the inductance coefficient for a core like this. And that defines how much inductance you get with one turn of a wire, basically. And it, it's not quite that. It's, it's AL is the inductance over the number of turns squared. So AL times the number of turns squared is equal to your inductance. Let's start by inserting two ungapped cores to 85. Put in the other one. Let's go ahead and install these clips just to make sure we're not crazy here. So we are getting a quality factor of 220 and an inductance of 9.5 millihenries. That's pretty sweet. Now, what happens if we swap in a different core? According to my calculations, what should that be? One millimeter core. Uh, this should measure 0.832 millihenries. Yeah, we measure 0.866 microhenries, or 0.8 millihenries. I'm guessing that's because I really have 47 turns. 0.868. Yeah, yeah, we've really got 47 turns. Okay, I wound an extra turn on this inductor. My bad. Okay, and with a two millimeter gap, two millimeter gap. Oh, they even give you the gap grind. They know you're gonna mix them up. Yeah, so that's an N87 core, one millimeter gap. Love them. Thank you. TDK. If we put in our two millimeter gapped core, we're now getting about half 0.5 millifarads, which aligns up very well. It's designed to work with a 0.2 millimeter gap, which gives us an inductance value of right around three millihenries. So, yeah, yeah, so this thing should be pretty good. The reason why my gut was telling me I wanted to keep the gap when it came to this core, it comes down to saturation. And basically, when you introduce a gap to the core, you reduce the effective inductance However, you, you effectively can get more power out of your inductor by doing so. Let, let me see if I can explain this well in words. Basically what happens is you 
end up gaining some ground with your flux density, where it's like the combination of current and turns ends up putting some amount of flux into your core. And when you add a gap, you can get more current before you saturate. You'll need to add more turns to compensate to get the same inductance. But even when you do that, so when you have more turns at a lesser intrinsic inductance value because of the, w the core material plus the gap, you end up being able to push more, cow more power through an equivalent inductor that has more turns. Obviously, there is diminishing returns because at some point, your gap becomes incredibly large or at some point, you're adding so many extra windings that you're going to lose that in resistive losses or you're going to run out of room in your core, like in your bobbin. So there are limits. However, it shouldn't be totally ridiculous. I think I'd want to tweak it a little more. I think for this core at the currents I'm thinking of, I think there's plenty of room here, but I'm, I've got a feeling that more turns and a bigger gap than 0.2 millimeters is ultimately going to be better for us. But we've already got a ton, well, a relative ton of these cores. So we may as well play around. Um, yeah, based on what I'm seeing in the magnetics design calculations here, I'd be better off with um, a core gap more like two millimeters. But based on the controller we're working with here, honestly, 0.8 microhenries is... Um, that's going to be pretty tricky to work with. I'll need to keep the input voltage relatively low on our inverter dev kit. However, this should allow us to demonstrate the effect of that Q factor. Because the Q factor is 85.8, and actually, you know what? What am I doing? We can switch to ESR. We can switch to effective resistance. All I need to do is bump this thing into resistance. And so... Let's go 100 hertz, we get 0.05 ohms. 120 hertz, about the same. One kilohertz, we are now getting point, uh, what is that, 57 milliohms? Now we're getting 6 point, 0 0.66 ohms of effective resistance at this frequency. Okay, let's play with that for a second. If we were to put 10 amps through this thing, I squared R, that's burning 66 watts. We're probably not going to get that much out of this core, assuming we don't saturate. I haven't done a full suite of calculations. Come on, guys. I just wound this in like 20 minutes, uh, 40 minutes, I just wound this thing off the cuff through a couple random calculations down. This was not a design process. This was playing around. It's a proof of concept. Let's use that point and let's switch over to our EI core. I don't know what these things are rated for for power. Oof. Do you see the difference that we just made? 37 ohms. You're not pushing 5 amps through this thing. You're not. I'm sorry. Now... If I remember correctly, this is the effective resistance at this frequency. This should be, when we're putting 10 kilohertz through it, this should be pretty close. Now, we're doing a square wave. It's a little different. It's not a sinusoid. This is probably using a sinusoid. But what I would expect is that the power dissipation, assuming we have enough voltage to push 5 amps through this thing, I believe we'd be looking at about 900 watts. That seems ridiculous, but I guess we'll find out. Okay, so what I'm hoping to see is that our efficiency improves by about that same amount, but this is not going to be apples to apples. This is apples to oranges. Yeah, this is 60% of that one. So we'll be looking at about twice as much peak current for the same steady state output. Uh, hopefully we don't trip something. Hopefully we don't blow up the board. Honestly, I've got half a mind to just try it. So, hey, let's wrap up this video. We talked about 
AL, we talked about some compromises. We talked a little bit about saturation. There's so much more to learn about transformer design. And, uh, man, I've got half a mind to do a deep dive and walk through more of the design process for a custom inductor, but that is a big topic and it would take a long time to do well. So I'm going to put that one on the back burner for a while and I'll just do what we got to do to get these projects rolling. And, um, yeah, we might need to catch you guys up at some point in the future with like a dedicated inductor design tutorial. This was obviously not that. I'm sure I did something stupid and you guys will let me know down in the comments, (laughs) but it was fun nonetheless. And I can't wait to get back into this project, test one versus the other, and show you a little bit more about that. All right. A special thanks to our channel members on YouTube and Patreon. Definitely appreciate you guys throwing a few bucks in the hat and helping to keep this whole thing rolling. If you like this video and can't wait for more, let me know by hitting that like button, getting subscribed, or leaving a comment down below. Most of all, I hope you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. Stay tuned for our next videos where we'll be powering this thing on, looking at the efficiency, and uh, playing with both these inductors to see which one we like better. I can't wait. See you in the next one.